All right, well, look, let's uh, see if we can get started with this, uh, this episode. And uh, I'm going to give you kind of a story. Uh, I'm not going to give you something laid out in notes with little headings and all that sort of thing. So if you can, try to follow what I'm saying. I know it's absolutely impossible to listen to a lecture without thinking about something else. I do it all the time, and then you miss something, and it's kind of hard to catch up. But, you know, I'll try not to bore you too much. So maybe you can, can, can follow some of what I'm going to say. And I say some because I probably am going to give you some stuff that's a little bit steep with, uh, with respect to electrophysiology. If you don't get it, it's okay. I'd just like for you to get the gist. So I'd like for you to kind of come away from here with a new concept about the way lungs work. And you're not going to see this in textbooks, uh, but I hope someday you might. So this is, this is pretty new stuff in terms of the way uh, the lungs take care of themselves and what they're doing right now inside you as you breathe. You never pay any attention to that because you don't have to, because they do it. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at how do your lungs stay clean. And then we'll talk a little bit about the impact of cystic fibrosis from these, these problems. This is what we're talking about. So these are the airways going down from the trachea splitting off at the carina, going into the major bronchi. They continue down every little once in a while, they branch off. And in fact, if you got in there and crawled out, if you were small enough to go, you would go through about 19 to 20 uh, sequential branches before you got out to the alveoli. Okay, so this is like a big tree upside down inside you with the alveoli as the leaves and the trunk and the branches and the twigs. Uh, forming the, the airways. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things just to note right up front is that the large airways called the bronchi are surrounded by cartilaginous rings. And they're also supplied with a full set of secretory glands. When we get down to the generation of about eight or nine, they become what we call the small airways or the bronchioles. The bronchioles do not have cartilaginous rings and they do not have, uh, uh, they do not have glands. This is the area that we're really particularly interested in because this is the area we have to take clean, uh, keep clean. So let's see here. <clears throat> if, we, if we just sort of... I stole this uh, illustration from Google, which is where everything gets stolen anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> Google Images. But it works very well. So these are the large airways. And what we're interested in are the fluids that are sitting up here on top of the, of the, uh, of the cells or the cilia uh, of the airways, both in the large airways and in the small airways. Okay, so we have this thing here. This is this fluid is called airway surface fluid. The airways are kept clean from moment to moment, mainly by a ciliated escalator. The ciliated escalator is the cilia beating constantly, or at least whenever they're irritated, combined with the fluid that they're immersed in. So we have a fluid here over the cilia that are beating below in both the small airways and the large airways. And this fluid is being swept up to your mouth. So it's coming from the depths of the, of the tracheobronchial tree all the way up the trachea. And when it gets up here, you swallow it, and it goes into your stomach, and then God knows where it goes. Probably winds up in the ocean out there somewhere in the sewer plant, hopefully. But <laughs> anyway. So but this area right here in the small airways is the one that we're really particularly concerned with because this is this area is most vulnerable to infection and inflammation and it's also very small you know in the trachea you've got a couple of mil a couple of centimeters in diameter but when we get down to that ninth or tenth, uh, eighth or ninth branch the diameters drop down to less than two millimeters usually it's about one or so and it keeps getting smaller from that so it doesn't take very much to close that once an airway is closed, you can't get any gas through it, and you can't get any gas through it, you can't use the alveoli, you can't use the alveoli, you're not going to oxygenate. If you don't oxygenate, you're going to sleep for a long time. Okay? So, so this is the critical area. <clears throat> this is the airway surface fluid. These are small airways, small diameter, and they're fairly vulnerable, especially in cystic fibrosis, because anytime you have problems with clearing the airway, this airway clearance, you increase the likelihood that bacteria or pathogens are going to settle, establish a colony, start breeding, and then you've got an infection. 
So then we get all kinds of pulmonary problems, such as chronic pulmonary, um, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, asthma. All of these things are kind of mainly centered here. Because these airways can, can and do collapse very easily, or they get swollen and they close. So it's imperative that these, this part of the airway especially stay clean. So, let's see. As I pointed out, in the small airways, there are no glands, and there are no cartilaginous rings. So these guys can collapse very easily. The large airways are held open by these stiff rings that are surrounding them. Okay, here's the dogma. We're concerned about this little layer of fluid that's sitting on, on the airway surface epithelia, this airway surface fluid. How is it maintained? Because if that gets screwed up, if, it gets, if, we, if we don't have enough of it, we sort of dry out and then we will just accumulate debris in the airway. If you accumulate that, as I just mentioned, you get problems. You get infections, you get inflammation, you get boom. If you secrete too much, if there's too much there, you fill it up and you can't get gas baskets, so you drown. So this little layer of film, of, of fluid, has to be held relatively constant throughout your entire life. If it gets screwed up, you may well, very well die. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, for the last 1980, 81, how many years is that? Almost 45? Get close to that. 35, 35, I can't see. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, anyway, the dogma has been that, well, what happens is the epithelial cells, these epithelial cells that form the lining of all the airway epithelium, those epithelial cells, maintain this layer by somehow sensing the depth of it. And we thought that these cells, whenever this thing is too deep, like it is now, if we want to say we have a normal... We, uh, a normal depth of about 10 microns. It may be larger than that. I don't exactly. Probably pair, depends on where you are. But anyway, let's say, say the normal is 10 microns. We want to keep it at that. Well, what we used to think was, or a lot of, a lot of people still do think, but I've seen the light. So, <laughs> so, it, so, so what I think the light says, or what they said, was that, look, all of these cells do the same thing at the same time. And they're all capable of either secreting or absorbing. So if it's too deep, we will turn on absorption and absorb this fluid so that it pulls it down. There's not too much of it. But if the absorption goes too long or too much or too active, it gets too dry and the thickness becomes too thin. So then the cells have to turn around and go backwards and secrete. And put more fluid back in there. So now if they don't turn off soon enough, they put out too much. So now they got to turn around again and absorb again to pull it back to where it's supposed to be. Okay? So then, when the... So what we can say is that, well, this would be maintained more or less level, or a constant, when the absorptive activity equals the secretory activity. All right, so here we have just <clears throat> a couple of diagrams of how secretion and absorption takes place. But I think you got the idea of the dogma. The dogma said that all these cells are capable of either secreting or absorbing, and when they do it, they have to do it in unison in order to keep the level more or less constant. Well, that's a pretty complicated system, really. How do these cells know when they've got to turn around and go backwards? So I, that's bothered me significantly because... I don't know of any examples of any other cells in cell physiology where epithelial cells can, can go both ways, where the same cell can secrete in one minute and absorb in another, except for the airways where this has been postulated for so, so long. So, so when these things are active, according to the old theory, when these things are about equal in their activity, this, this, this would maintain this thing here, but they've got to have some kind of signal to know when it's too big and too little. They don't sit up there with a measuring stick measuring it. So it presents a little bit of a uh, conceptual problem. In cystic fibrosis, I'll just comment that what the, the dogma was that in cystic fibrosis, the absorption was much, much higher 
than the secretion. And as a consequence, in CF patients, they pull the fluid down, left the airway surface fluid too thick or thin and dry, and therefore we, it's got set up for problems with clearance. So patients with cystic fibrosis have chronic lung infection and eventually lose their, their uh, respiratory function because of it. Okay, so that sets you up for the dogma that we've had. What, a, what, a, what, what else could it be? What could we be doing? There's another reason that I object to, <clears throat> to this uh, dogma of the way the thing works. <clears throat> and that's simply because, as I said before, I don't know of any examples of cells that can either secrete or absorb at a moment's notice, back and forth. And if you look through, uh, uh, for examples, in exocrine physiology, what you see is that these, these functions are divided up. They're parceled out to different cells who are assigned to do one thing or the other. So, for example, here in the, um, in the uh, salivary glands, we have acini, which are constantly secreting, or that's what they do from the time they get here to the time they go away, they secrete. And then we have ductal cells that absorb and modify the fluid. Okay? If we look at the pancreas, the pancreas is the same. The acini secrete a fluid, and in the duct, it absorbs the chloride and secretes the bicarbonate. But these are all doing the same thing, at, but not changing and going backwards. The sweat gland is the same. In the coil, we have a secretory portion that's always, those cells are always secreting, or they secrete whatever they're told to. They don't absorb. And in the ductal part of it is where we reabsorb, this up here is where we reabsorb the sodium chloride that this portion secretes. So we remove the sodium chloride, and the sweat comes out of here on the skin, hypotonic. Okay, so, <clears throat> and then if you look in the intestine, you have a similar sort of arrangement. It's not a duct and an acini arrangement, but you have crypts in the, uh, in the uh, intestine that secrete the fluid, and then up uh, we have villi then that are designated to absorb. So again, one cell, one function. Not one cell, two functions. So <clears throat> where does that leave us then when we, when we want to talk about this, these airways? Do they actually all turn around and go different in the opposite direction, whatever they're, they're, they get a signal? Or is there some other way for, it to ha for them to handle it? We don't see any gland structures here, as we have in the, small, in the large airways. So where's the secretion? We don't see any ducts, fortunately, so where's the absorption? All right, well, that's the problem we've got now. Let's see what we can figure out about this. So <clears throat> look at this. This is plicated. Okay, see this epithelium? This is a cross-section of the airway. All right, if this is an airway, I cut my finger like that. Look at the end of it. What's left? It looks like this. So we have pleats all the way around here. All these are, I call these pleats. And then the pleats give rise to folds all the way around on all, this, all these plications. So we kind of divide this up into pleated sections and folded sections, or tips, uh, uh, tips in the fold section. And if we look at it on face, just looking, open it up and looking down on it, it looks like a garden with ridges and, and furrows. Okay, so, um, so it's very wavy, rugose, or wrinkled, or however you want to placate it. So, <clears throat> so this is the structure we've got. And how does it work, then? How does it work? What's going on here? There we go. I'm going too fast. All right, so this, this is the example, if we sort of diagram this out as we did before, where we say these, these look like pleats and these look like folds here, maybe. So why is it? Why, are they, why is a small airway plicated like that? Okay, so I think we, we were talking about why this has this kind of a structure. Why does it look like? And what I was saying is that when I asked uh, that question to a, a number of people, like the, often they will respond, well, if you stop and think about the way you breathe, when you breathe, when you inhale, your lungs get bigger. And as they get bigger, they pull open the, uh, the airways. They pull on the airways. And we call that re recoil forces. So as you inhale, recoil forces get stronger, and they pull on the airways to open them, to make them larger. And so, and then whenever you exhale, they collapse, get smaller and smaller, and actually, if you sit there and you breathe out as far as you can, 
Go ahead, just breathe out all the way to, to what we call respiratory reserve. All the way. All right, when you've done that, all these little small airways have closed. And you still have about 500 to a, a, a mils to a liter of air trapped in your alveoli. Okay? So, <clears throat> so one reason that they're placated like this is simply to accommodate this expansion contraction as you breathe, respiratory, from moment to moment. Now that has an additional important function that we'll talk about at the end of the lecture, maybe, or in the, at the end of this section. But, so, but what else? I mean, we're still left with our question of who's secreting, who's absorbing, what's going on. So, think about it. All right, so what we do, we go to the lab and we say, okay, let's get ourselves a, a pig or a piece of lung and see what we can uh, get out of it. So with a little bit of practice, you can uh, dissect a small piece of, uh, of bronchiole. This, is a, this piece would be about uh, two millimeters or about a millimeter and a half maybe in diameter. And then you slit it longitudinally like that so you can open it up. And you wind up with a little piece of tissue that's about two by three millimeters or so, very small. And then you can mount that little piece of tissue over what we call a trampoline that's glued to the top of a, of a, um, a cylinder with a hole in it. This, that's this thing over here, okay? So I've got my little piece of tissue here on top of this trampoline, and I transfer that over here. Now, this is a just glass capillary. The end of it has been fire polished, and I have a little device so that I can press this, this capillary down onto the surface of the of the bronchial epithelium and get what we call an electrical seal. Now, when I say electrical seal, I'm talking electrophysiology, and this is what we need for what we call an oozing chamber. Well, the oozing chamber is, is named after <laughs> Professor Oosing, who in the 30s and 40s uh, developed this uh, chamber and discovered that uh, epithelia are capable of generating current. They produce electrical phenomena, and he was able to do that by the same kind of system that we've mimicked here. That is, you put a piece of epithelium between two compartments. Okay, you seal it between two compartments electrically so that now just the epithelia separates one compartment from the other. And therefore, if you put electrodes in each of those compartments, you can measure the voltage or the potential difference that the tissue generates. If you get a little bit fancier, you can actually measure the current that the tissue generates because tissue transports, that's, that's secreting or absorption, absorbing, transports ions. And ions are electrical charges. And the movement of electrical charge creates current. The movement of current creates voltage. So if you can measure the voltage and, and you can calculate the resistance, you can also get the current. So the measure of the current in a noosing chamber is a direct reflection of the active transport of the tissue. So that's what we're doing here, okay? So we've set this little piece of bronchial up in this, on our uh, uh, gadget, press down the capillary, put in the electrodes, and now we, when we add different inhibitors or agonists, we can see the change in the current that reflects the physiological activity of the transport systems. Everybody kind of follow me? Okay, so you got the general idea, right? All right, so this is the electrophysiology that we're going to be looking at here. Now, let's move over here and see how we're going to apply this. All right, what I have di diagrammed here <coughs> are a couple of, of cells. And these are kind of models of what we would call an absorptive cell and a secretory cell. So on the left, we have absorption. On the right, we have secretion. There are some very basic components that are basically usually, well, universally associated with the, these kinds of cells doing this kind of function. So let's just look first at absorption. Okay, absorption depends upon ENAC in this particular case, ENAC. ENAC is the epithelial sodium channel. Okay, it's that channel that's located in the apical membrane or the luminal membrane of the epithelial cell. Is that a channel that allows sodium to come from the lumen into the cell and then be picked up and transported actively out of the cell by the sodium potassium ATPase? Okay? Sodium potassium ATPase. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah, because that drives life. All cells have sodium potassium ATPase in their membranes. 
in order to keep the intracellular concentration of potassium high and the intracellular concentration of sodium low. <coughs> okay. So, that's what happens in, abs uh, in absorption. We actively move sodium across the cell by spending ATP on it. Now, what about this concept of electroneutrality? Heard that one before? Electroneutrality? All right. Electroneutrality is a very fundamental law of electrochemistry. And it says that you cannot move one, uh, a positive charge without moving a negative charge. So, whenever you, whenever you move one charge, you have to move another. <clears throat> and that's what happens here, okay? And Mother Nature's really smart. She's really good at electrophysiology, a lot better than I am. So, she figured out a long time ago that if she pumped the sodium out of the cell over here and she opened up a gate for chloride, when she pumped the sodium across, she would set up the electrochemical gradient for the chloride because you, you can't separate these charges, at least in, to any significant extent. If you separate them very much, you get lightning, and we don't want lightning inside the cell. That's not, to, that's not to say that you can't move a sodium over here and leave a chloride there, just one of them. But you can't do very many, otherwise things go boom, poof. So basically, electroneutrality says we have to move the same number of charges per unit time. All right, so that's what's happening. Mother Nature got a free ride for her chloride because chloride is just going to come across here passively following her lover sodium. So I call this Nate and Chloro. And so Nate and Chloro go together like a really lovely pair. And uh, usually they get along quite well together. Sometimes they have a fuss, but usually they're quite, quite nicely matched. And so then, on the other, so this is, this is characteristic. Uh, these are characteristic uh, components of an absorptive cell. This is the one we want to pay attention to here is ENAC, because we can manipulate ENAC. We can, we can block him. In secretion, we have a different mechanism now. It works a little bit on the contrary, because now we're driving the chloride, not the sodium. See, over here, the chloride was coming across uh, uh, freely. Over here, the sodium is going to be coming across freely. So we actively move chloride into the cell via this electro-neutral co-transporter. And that's a sodium-potassium chloride, two chloride co-transporter. So that means that every time this molecule does a cycle, it moves one sodium, one potassium, and two chlorides into the cell. And there's no separation of charge, so we call that electro-neutral. Once the chloride is in the cell, its electrochemical gradient drives it out the cell across the apical membrane through an anion channel or an anion conductance. In this case, we've labeled it CFTR because that's what uh, carries the charge, uh, carries the chloride, both in, some, in, in many types of secretion and in this uh, absorption over here. So CFTR is our, is our baby. Okay. But the characteristic thing here is this NKCC. This is what drives secretion. Sodium, the ENAC is what allows absorption. So we've got these two basic mechanisms that have two very clear differences in how they handle uh, anions and cations in order to either make them be absorbed or to make them be secreted. All right, so ready to do experiment? Go to lab? Okay. See what's going to happen here. <clears throat> so, I am going to say that this is my control. This is, a, this is my the relative amount of current that my tissue is, trans, is uh, uh, creating in my oozing chamber. So, when it's sitting there, I, I look at it, I measure it, and I say, well, it's got 100 units of current here. I, this is all relative, so I'll just call it 100 units. And that's what it's doing before I do anything to it. It's just sitting there percolating along like it is in your lungs right now. So, what if we inhibit the ENAC? We have a drug that's very specific for blocking ENAC. It's called amylaride. If we put that in the solution, it will plug up the ENAC hole and sodium can't get through. So, if I do that, what do you expect to happen to my current? So go down. Now, if all of my cells are absorbing and I put this on, what's going to happen to my current? It could go down to basically zero. Yeah? You agree? That's what I would think. 
So you want to do it? Okay, let's put it on and see what happens. We put the, put the ameteroid on over here and block that sodium from getting into the cell, shuts down the, the absorption. And lo and behold, it didn't knock out all of the current. Knocked out some of it, about, about a third or more, but it didn't get it all. So, hmm, well, what else could we do? Well, what if we use something to block the secretion? What if we block the secretion? Well, we have something that we know will hit this guy here that drives secretion, the NKCC. What is that stuff? That's bumetanide. If we put bumetanide on here, we'll block it. So if we put bumetanide there and block that, we shut down the secretion. So what do you say we just add some bumetanide to our ameloride in the, in, the, in the chamber and see what happens? Yep. We knocked out almost all of it. So, ameloride knocked out a significant chunk of the transport, and bumetanide knocked out a significant part of the transport. But ameloride is acting on absorptive cells, and bumetanide is acting on secretory cells. So it's very hard to me to get around the argument that says that there are two types of cells in the, uh, uh, in the small airway epithelium. One type is secreting, while the other type is absorbing. And they're doing it concurrently, simultaneously. And if you think about that a little bit, you say, that's kind of stupid, because it's kind of like carrying rocks from one pile and then taking them back again. Is this going to go, you know, what's it, what good does it do to secrete and absorb? Well, that's where we're going to get into the, into the uh, structure. So, <clears throat> if, we, if I got you convinced that we have to have two types of cells to accommodate for the data, Let's see how we can let's see what we can look at here to, um, to see what's going on. So here we go back to our plicated epithelium, and we know that some of these cells are absorbing and some of these are secreting. Which ones are doing what? Hmm. Well, here's where we can get a little bit a little bit fancy with histology and do some immunohistochemistry. And so what if we use a an antibody? to the NKCC protein, the one that supports secretion. Okay? So I have a good colleague who loaned us some antibody that he developed for this protein. And I will say that all cells have NKCC, but secretory cells have about 20 to 30 times as much as most cells, and it's always located in the basal, in the basal lateral membrane, as we saw in the diagram. Okay, so let's stay in the tissue with the antibody for NKCC. If we do that, look what you get. Here's the NKCC down here. Yeah? Down here in this pleat. You don't see very much up here in the fold, if any. Yeah? So this, the NKCC is local, localizing down here in the base of the pleat. And that says to me that these cells are the secretory cells. And um, this lovely a uh, young lady who worked in the lab for a while had the patience and the, and the determination to go along and count each of these, or look at each of these cells that was stained and plot its position relative to its distance from the, from the base. So all of those cells that are positive within KC, she, she plotted over here as a position from the base. And then those cells that didn't label, she plotted over here as a position of the base also. So the NKCC positive cells, it turns out, that most of them are about uh, are in the bottom half of the base of the of the pleat, and those that don't stain are in the top half of the pleat. Okay. So, <clears throat> to me, that's pretty good evidence that now we've separated the function of secretion from absorption, and without going further, we could probably surmise that these cells up here are absorptive, and these cells are secretory. We can go a little bit further because we we struggled a lot with an antibody for the ENAC, for the epithelial sodium channel. And we'd like to know where he's located. And you could, you're, you're probably with me and already kind of guessing. But this is, this is more or less the result of what we found. And then if we use the beta ENAC, the ENAC has three, diff uh, three different components. And the antibody that we seem to, seems to work best is the one to the beta form. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. But when we do that, it looks like most of our, our antibody is localizing up here around, along the 
the top of the uh, folds of the of this epithelium. Now, Miss um, Mangledore left the lab before she, before we had this antibody worked out, so we didn't get to to uh, challenge her her uh, determination to do studies on the ENAC as she did on the NKCC. But this the stain the staining and immunized chemistry is done by Dr. Uh, Guillermo Flores. So, <clears throat> oops. Here's another one of his slides. So again, you see ENAC is up here labeling on the top part of the, of the uh, folds. And uh, this red stuff is just the uh, um, beta tubulum, which indicates, a, which is associated with cilia, to give you a, an idea of where the apical membrane is. Okay, so where did that leave us now? We got something of an idea of the structure and the functions that are going on. So here's where we get kind of interesting. Why is it plicated? It's plicated because you need a washing machine. <laughs> and it makes a washing machine. Because look what's going to happen now. Okay? If we, if we just look, this is, here's our, our, the folds in our uh, plication of the epithelium, going around like this. And we saw that our absorptive cells seem to be located up here and that our secretory cells are located down here. So while this thing is running, the first thing we have to do is the, or we say that the the uh, base of the pleat cells are secrete. They secrete fluid from the extracellular fluid compartment in the serosis space, secrete it into this pleat. So now it's kind of trapped in there, and it fill that up. And then, as the fluid rises and comes up to the to the folds, the absorptive cells reabsorb it. So now you see what we have are basal pleats that secrete, luminal folds that absorb, and then the ASF recirculates. Okay? So if it's, you're looking all the way down the, up and down the airway, uh, the small airways that have these pleats in them, there, as it goes along, these, the fluid is being recirculated to keep it moving. Now the beauty of this, in, 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 with respect to the uh, structure, is that every time you breathe is like an ag agitator in the washing machine. Because this pleat begets, if this is a pleat on the, of my cells, whenever, whenever I exhale, the pleats squeeze, and when I inhale, they open. So it's doing that to the fluid, so it's moving the fluid up and down, up and down. Up and down is relative, but anyway, you got the idea, right? It's squeezing it back and forth, back and forth. So it keeps it agitated so that it doesn't, doesn't uh, consolidate it's always liquid and moving, and the cilia can paddle it along. All right? So, so <clears throat> the basal pleats secrete, the luminal folds absorb, and the ASF is recirculating continuously all along the, air, on, all along the small airway. <clears throat> and what does this do? Well, it keeps it wet, but not too wet. Because if it secretes, if it, if it always absorbs a little bit more than it secretes, then as this level comes up, it'll be taken up before it can fill the airway. Okay? So as long as we keep, a, keep secretion going and absorption a little bit more than uh, secretion, it won't, it won't dry out. You think it might dry out, but it won't dry out because this is moving up and down all the time. And there's no absorption down here, so this fluid can never be absorbed. So the airway is going to maintain itself relatively wet but and not too dry by virtue of the structure and the way the secretory and the absorptive cells are put together in combination with your breathing in and out to expand and close the airways. All right, so, so that, I hope, gives us a, a reasonable reason for why the airway is constructed uh, as it is. And the fact is that these cells are not turning around and going backwards every time they think the levels is a little bit uh, screwy. They sit there, they do their thing, and they're happy, and, and every sta thing stays more or less uh, constant. So, <clears throat> okay, so let's move on. Let's look at cystic fibrosis now. Why can't cystic fibrosis patients keep their, their, their airways clean? So one, of tw one in 20 of you should carry the gene for cystic fibrosis. One, of tw one in 20 of you should have a mutation for the disease. So it's fairly common. It's the most common uh, mutation 
a lethal disease among Caucasians, and it's also fairly common in other, other races. But <clears throat> anyway, the effect is on CFTR. That, that molecule that we were talking about earlier is being the conductive pathway for chloride, for anions. So CFTR is mutated. When it's mutated, it doesn't conduct. It doesn't allow chloride to move across the cell in either secretion or absorption. So people with cystic fibrosis get mucoviscidosis. So cystic fibrosis used to be called, and still is called in many quarters of Europe, mucoviscidosis <laughs> instead of cystic fibrosis. Muco, mucus, viscid, thick, doses, stayed up state of thick, sticky mucus. So, if you look at their lungs, this is the lung from a 17-year-old boy who was in for a transplant. This is what, what he went in with. This is the lung that they took out of him. This compared to the normal lung over here. This looks like, looks like hell. Because you see a couple of open airways, and these are very displaced because they're out in the periphery. It shouldn't be ever open that much. But most of them were filled with this white gunk, purulent pus from the infections that are caused by being unable to keep the airway clean. So it gets infected, gets inflamed, destroys the tissue, and eventually you lose the respiratory function that's capable of supporting life. And you either die or you get a transplant. So that's where, that's, that, that's where this lung came from. If we look at it at a more microscopic level, you see over here a normal small airway, nice open lumen. Over here a CF airway, where everything is plugged up and gunked up, and there's no air that's going to get through that airway. So plugged up with pus. If we look at it macroscopically, you can see here, if you pull on this mucus, it's thick, it's thick, it's just plugged up this entire airway. It's like a chunk of jelly that you can just pull out. That airway, that airway is no good for anything. So, so these are the, that's the result of chronic infection and inflammation and cystic fibrosis. Fortunately, the process goes on relatively slowly, so there's time for, um, to take precautionary actions. Uh, and our therapy for the disease has improved enormously in my lifetime, because now the median expected lifespan is about 40, 40 years of age. When I started this, it was less than nine. So, seven at that point, I don't know. But anyway, we've gotten much better at treating it. And transplants have become a long way also. But we still don't have a cure for disease. We have got a couple of medications that are coming along looking pretty good. But God forbid that you'd ever, ever have to buy one. You have to, you'd have to sell your house to get six months supply. $330,000 a year for this drug. It's just... You hear about drug prices and the EpiPens and all this kind of stuff? We've gone crazy, folks. You're going to get me off on this, so we won't finish the lecture. Because <laughs> this really pulls my chain. You have these, these CEOs sitting up there pulling $30, $30 million a year salaries and people trying to pay $300,000 for a drug. This is just sick. OK, enough. <laughs> Let's get back to where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> all right, so Paul de St. Agnes is one of the fathers of cystic fibrosis. He studied with. Uh, with uh, God, I'm blanking. Charlotte Anderson. <clears throat> she actually named the disease in early 1940 to 1944, and in 44, the year I was born, she determined that it uh, was a genetic disease. She defined it. She thought it was it had something to do with the pancreas, and it was more like celiac disease. But then she changed her mind and said, look, this is a disease entity, and it is actually genetic. So she had a fellow start studying with her, Paul de St. Agnes, this guy. And he's the guy who discovered, while she went on vacation during the middle of a heat wave in New York, that all of her patients were coming in with heat prostration. Heat prostration is caused by a loss of the extracellular fluid, so your blood can't circulate well enough. You get too hot. And you, if you're not corrected, you die. So they had this massive heat wave. This is before air conditioning in New York. And he saw this mound of patients coming in. And that's, heat prostration is actually caused by loss, loss of fluid. The fluid, the reason they were coming in is because the fluid, as he discovered later, 
had salt in it. It was very salty. It's about four to five times more salty than this, the sweat of normal people. And the physiology of that is if you lose the salt from your blood, you don't have enough blood and you can't circulate, so you, you wilt like a flower. Okay, so he made this great discovery that, you know, you can diagnose people with cystic fibrosis on the basis of the concentration of salt in their sweat. So, about 20 years later, 15 years later, he asked this question, so what is the basic defect of cystic fibrosis? And then, since he, since he knew that it was a, a problem with electrolytes, and Dorothy Anderson didn't, uh, it was Dorothy, not Charlotte, didn't uh, believe him, she never really accepted that this was an electrolyte problem. It had to be something in the guts with the pancreas. <clears throat> but he insisted that it was, and so he asked this question in 1967, which is now what, 50 years ago? Did I subtract that one right? Okay, and it's, the question still remains. What is the relation between the electrolyte abnormality and the abnormality of the mucus? Okay, tough question. Could not answer it. And when we found that the basic defect was due to chloride impermeability, that is, that we couldn't move the chloride across, I remained confounded because what does chloride have to do with mucus? Why could chloride change the mucus? It doesn't make any sense because chloride doesn't react or interact with anything. It's just a happy-go-lucky little <coughs> ion, anion. So, usually we study physiology or of science in order to understand the disease. But maybe in this case, if we study the disease, we can find out something about physiology and science. So that's what we did, okay? So we have a look here. These are the organs that are affected in cystic fibrosis. Okay? All of these organs, they're ex basically all exocrine organs, salivary glands, airways, submucosal glands, the liver, gallbladder, all of these. All of these glands produce mucus, and all of the mucus comes out abnormal, except in the sweat gland, where we have electrolyte abnormality. But there's not partic anything particularly perplexing about that, because the sweat gland is the one gland that has lots of CFTR, but it doesn't produce any mucus. Very little mucus, so there's not any, anything there really to get mucked up. What we also observe is that every one of these organs, uh, if we have any evidence at all, the evidence says or suggests that bicarbonate transport is abnormal. Chloride is abnormal also, but bicarbonate is also abnormal, and it's because bicarbonate is also transported by CFTR. So when we mutate CFTR so that it doesn't transport the anion, it doesn't transport chloride, which is what we found at first, then we found that it doesn't transport bicarbonate either. Okay? So we get rid of that, we get rid of both bicarbonate and chloride secretion. Okay, so what does bicarbonate have to do with mucus? Could it be that the absence of bicarbonate causes changes in the mucus that are deleterious, that are pathogenic? Well, what do you do? You're a physiologist, biochemist? Test it. Okay, so that's what we did. And I was really fortunate to have several postdocs and a fellow in my lab who got very interested in this and did some really nice work showing the effects of bicarbonate on mucus release from the intestine and from the endocervix of, of mice. So these are our uh, experiments in which we just hook up a piece of intestine or the endocervix is a tube. You hook it up so that you can perfuse with the with solution coming in one side and collect the solution coming out on the other side. And then if you take what comes out and measure the amount of mucus or glycoprotein that's in it, you can tell whether there was an effect of the, uh, of, on the release of, uh, of mucus. And that's what they did, okay? So they played with things that affected bicarbonate transport. So if they took away all the bicarbonate from the solutions that bathed the tissue, they got no mucus release. Basically none. If they inhibited the bicarbonate going through CFTR with a special inhibitor, GLI-H101, 
which blocks the normal CFTR so that chloride or bicarbonate can go through it. They also got no mucus release. If they inhibited the bicarbonate uh, transporter that's on the basal membrane that moves the bicarbonate into the cell so that it can be secreted, they block that with DIDs, then they also got no mucus release. But if they didn't do any of that nasty stuff and they just gave the tissue some nice bicarbonate, they got a beautiful, a beautiful mucus release. So having it in bicarbonate allows the mucus to get out of there, gets it released and can, can move as it should. If you do anything to mess up the bicarbonate, anything they did to mess up the bicarbonate, messed up the mucus release. And to give that a little bit more visual impact, <coughs> so our bottom line here is mucus release requires bicarbonate. The visual impact comes over here from some histopathology, some, from some uh, histology of uh, the, the cervix. So if you incubate the cervix in bicarbonate and stimulate, you see that most of the, uh, the glandular uh, ductal opens, openings are clear. They have very little mucus associated with them. See, over here we're staining with an antibody uh, at a little higher mag, but these are relatively clear of, of mucus. Maybe a little bit there, but not very much. On the other hand now, if you take away the bicarbonate, no bicarbonate, you see now mucus accumulated in, in, in a number of these ducts fairly significantly. And it's very clear over here with the antibody standing for MUC5B that all of these ducts have mucus uh, stuck in them. So, I think you have to conclude that if you take away the bicarbonate, the mucus gets pretty sticky. So bicarbonate is an incredibly important little anion. And most of us as physiologists are a little bit embarrassed about it because um, bicarbonate is the major buffer in the extracellular fluid. It's the major buffer in your blood. And so we've just, as physiologists, kind of bl blithely gone along thinking, oh, nothing about this bicarbonate. It's just a buffer sitting out there to keep the pH right. Yeah? But here's, this is a pretty wonderful thing it's doing. And it turns out there's a lot of other things that bicarbonate is doing too that we never appreciated. And we're embarrassed as physiologists because I went for years trying to get rid of the bicarbonate in my solutions because it's a pain in the fanny to deal with. Because if you want to keep the pH correct, you have to keep the CO2 correct. So you have to keep constant CO2 and, and the bubble it and all this kind of stuff. So it's just a hassle. So we just get rid of it and use something like Tris or phosphate buffer or something that doesn't. Anyway, woe is us. Uh, always be careful about doing something that's too easy. Okay, so, so how does this work? How does bicarbonate do its thing here? Well, to get a hold on that, we have to go back a few years to, to Pedro Verdugo's work, and I happened to, get to come across this. And when I first saw it, I didn't make any, I mean, I just, but then I it got hung up in there or something, but because then I suddenly realized, wait a minute, this is something's going on here. Okay, so what's the deal? Pedro Verdugo observed in the early 80s that granules, when they were granules of mucin from goblet cells or from, from wherever they were released, they were that they were in little compact granules inside the cell. But when they were released, they ex boom, they, they just explode. And they change volume by something of uh, 500 to 1,000 fold. So, and they do that within a period of a couple of seconds. So this is a pretty dramatic phenomenon that's going on here with, the getting, with these mucins. So if we look at a mucin molecule, it's pretty impressive because these are the largest molecules in biology. They can have molecular weights up to a billion. They can be a millimeter in length. They're huge. And they're characteristically peppered or populated with fixed negative charges. Okay? So, what about the negative charges and the positive charges? Well, there's an old rule that says likes repel. Okay? So if you have two negative charges, the closer you put together, the, uh, the greater the force they repel. And so if you have this molecule that's got all these fixed negative charges on it, when the negative charges are exposed, they're going to push against each other and stretch this thing out as big as it can. Okay? So, pretty neat. Because these molecules, with their negative charges, represent molecules that have the lowest coefficient of friction known. 
So now if you want to get rich, you just figure out how to make enough nuisance to use for motor oil. <laughs> and you'll have an engine that lasts forever. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so this presents a problem, though, for Mother Nature. She figured that part out, but she had to figure out something else, too, because look, we can't just go around with all these things exploded inside us, otherwise we'd be bigger than the building. So we keep them, she keeps them packaged in these little uh, mucin granules inside goblet cells or wherever the, whatever the appropriate cell is. So they're all packaged there until, she, until that cell gets the signal and says, hey, it's time to get rid of this. Let it go. And then when that happens, they go out and the granules explode. <laughs> and that, was, that was Pedro's uh, observation that this has happened. So as I said before, these are stored in compacted uh, little granules, and then after they're excreted, they blow up, they explode. The way she's able to do that, the way she's able to get them compacted in those little granules, is to pack them in there with a lot of calcium and a lot of protons. She makes the, makes the pH very low and increases the calcium concentration to very, very high. Now, can you imagine why she did that? Why does she put calcium in there? Because calcium is a cation. It's a divalent cation, isn't it? And a proton is a single cation, positive charge. So the calcium's got two positive charges, proton's got one. If I put two calcium, uh, two positive charges next to two negative charges, what happens? They attract. You've heard that before too. Opposites attract. L I, what did I say before? Op I said it backwards. Likes repel, opposites attract. Okay, in, in electrophysiology. Um, okay, so if we have a calcium, two positive charges, that will neutralize or shield, as we call it, two negative charges. So those negative charges don't see each other anymore, and they're happy to sit there next to each other. So now Mother Nature can just put this whole big molecule into a little tiny thing and let it sit there peacefully until there's a signal for it to dump out, and then something's got to happen. Now, what's got to happen? Once that granule gets out of there, how do we get the calcium and the protons away from those negative charges so that they see each other and this thing can whoop? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because I'm going to give you this wonderful illustration of this, this highly uh, sophisticated lady from La Jolla who's a little bit uptight, and we asked her if she would be willing to take a shampoo with bicarbonate. And she agreed, and look what happened. <laughs> She's having a hell of a good time now. And that's what happens with our mucins when they come out of that little, those little granules. Boom. So why does it happen? Okay, here we go back to our bicarbonate. So we, let's say we have this little model here. This is our goblet cell. It's got a, a bunch of... Uh, granules sitting in there, these are mucus granules, and we have a couple of other epithelial cells sitting over here that are capable of secreting anions. And let's say that those guys are secreting bicarbonate. So we stimulate these guys to secrete, and when they do, it increases the intracellular messenger, which is cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is known to turn on CFTR, and it's also, we also stimulate the release of uh, these uh, granules simultaneously. So now when CFTR is turned on, it's open, so bicarbonate can go out. Now, when bicarbonate goes out, these molecules that have, are all bound up with calcium and with protons are sitting there. They're not expanded. They may be loosened up a little bit, but they haven't blown up until they see the bicarbonate. What's the bicarbonate going to do? Bicarbonate is going to compete that calcium away from the anion site on the mucus. Okay? So bicarbonate is in equilibrium with carbonate. Carbonate is a double negative charge. Bicarbonate is a single negative charge. They both bind with calcium. Bicarbonate will neutralize protons because it neutralizes acid. And when we do that, we take those things away from the negative charges on those, those bound up mucin molecules. And those negative charges are now free to look at each other and say, hey, I don't want you. And so they press a, a, away and expand this thing, and it explodes. So if we go to the next step here, show the bicarbonate is secreted. Bicarbonate <coughs> removes the 
the cation shielding from those uh, anions. And when it does that, these anions, these mucin molecules, are able to explode. Okay? So there's your calcium over here bound with bicarbonate and with carbonate, and there's your proton over there bound with carbonic acid. And these are the negative, the, the naked bound negative ions pushing this molecule apart. So that's an important part of this, this airway surface fluid because our airway surface fluid has mucus in it. Mucus is extremely important for trapping particles so that they can be carried away in the fluid. So what happens in cystic fibrosis now? Well, we, I think we've already established that the problem in cystic fibrosis is they don't secrete bicarbonate. So what do you think is going to happen here? We stimulate. Yep. And then we get excess hydrosis with the loss of these of the granules going out and popping for the thing. And we're stimulating, we're trying to we're oops, we're we're trying to stimulate CFTR, but CFTR is not there or it's malfunctioning, so we can't get any bicarbonate out there. Since we can't get any bicarbonate out there, this mucus never opens up. It's still bound with the calcium and the and the protons. So it doesn't explode. So it remains thick and sticky mucoviscidosis. And that thick, sticky mucus is hard to transport. And if it's hard to transport, it's going to make it really hard to clear the airway. If you can't clear the airway, you're going to accumulate bugs. You accumulate bugs, you get an infection, you get an infection, you got an inflammation, swelling of the tissue, deterioration of the tissue, loss of the lung. Ah. OK. So what are we missing here? Missing some evidence. Is there bicarbonate secretion in the lung? You ever think about by the lung actually secreting bacon soda? You think your lungs are filled with baking soda? Because <laughs> that's what baking soda is, is this sodium bicarbonate. It has a million uses. So, but is it in the small airways? Well, <clears throat> It's important that it's in the small airways because the small airways have a lot of mucus uh, cells in them. And here we're stating for PAS, which stains uh, mucins, this nice dark uh, blue, I think it's showing up here. But it, you notice where it's located. It's located in the base of the pleats. Long in there. So if that's where it is, it would be pretty appropriate to have some bicarbonate being secreted in there. Would you agree? No. Oh. Well, is that true? Well, does it secrete bicarbonate? All right. <clears throat> if we look at this, we say, okay, we're just doing a couple of experiments here. And we're using different agonists, but the point is, uh, I think you can you can get fairly easily from the graphs. Here's our control rate of bicarbonate secretion. If we stimulate it with uh, force golden IBMX, that raises the cyclic AMP, and that opens the, chloride, the CFTR uh, bicarbonate chloride channel. And when we do that, we see that our current goes up substantially, suggesting or giving good evidence that this tissue is secreting bicarbonate. And the reason we can say that is because we left bicarbonate as the only ion there that it could transport. So we, we poisoned the sodium uh, absorption, and we took away the chloride, and we just left bicarbonate. So the only thing it can transport now is bicarbonate. And sure enough, that's what it's doing. And we can block that by adding this inhibitor of CFTR you see it comes back down. We can also stimulate it with another group of uh, agonists that are related to the nucleosides, UTP, uracil, uracil uh, triphosphate. It's kind of a brother to ATP. And that stimulates very well also, and that can be blocked by another inhibitor called uh, niflumic acid. So we have two means of stimulating bicarbonate in small airways. And it may be that, by, that the cystic fibrosis patients are able to survive because of this secondary mechanism of secreting bicarbonate. Because if everything were CFTR, there would be no bicarbonate. But, and this may offer us an, uh, an avenue of treating the disease also. If we can figure out how to manipulate this mode. All right, so where is the bicarbonate secreted? Well, if we, we got Dr. Boron to give us some antibody to uh, the K1 NBC1, 
And that is a co-transporter for bicarbonate, which loads the cell with bicarbonate so that it can be secreted. It's in the basal membrane of these cells. And as you see, most of it is predominantly expressed down here in the lower half of the crypts, right along with the secretory portion of the uh, of NKCC1 for fluid secretion. This is there presumably for enhanced bicarbonate secretion. And this is also where we find the, predominant, the predominance of mucus uh, cells for mucus secretion. So it's all beautifully coincident, structurally magnificent. So, how do we tie this up? So we go back to our pleats and fold model, and we kind of summarize this, and we say, okay, what's going on in the small airways in fluid, bicarbonate, and mucus secretion? Well, we found out that the pleats secrete and the folds absorb. Okay, so here we're secreting in the pleat, and we should absorb in the fold. Saw that before? Okay, but the, we, we now learn that the pleats secrete bicarbonate. So we take our baking soda and shoot it in there. So this, this, this fluid now is rich with bicarbonate to accommodate the next step. If we secrete mucus cells, mucins are released here, the cells come out there, and with the bicarbonate there, they poop and, 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 and get bigger and bigger. And I'm sorry, my animation, I'm not talented enough to make this go poof. <laughs> like it should, but it, hopefully you got the idea. Okay? So the mucus cells release mucins into bicarbonate of the pleat space, and that allows them to expand so that they can be transported and mixed in with the ASF, with the airway surface fluid. And that's the ingredients of how your lungs stay clean. Because now we've got the fluid there, we mix it with mucus, we expand the mucus, the mucus can trap any debris. The mucus and the fluid are captured in the airway surface fluid, and are, are transported in the airway fl surface fluid over the cilia, which is the ciliary escalator, to move this nasty stuff out and up so you can swallow it and get rid of it. So, so it all does it in a wonderful way so that, the airway, so that you don't drown by too much secretion and that you don't dry up by not enough secretion or too much absorption. And it's put together in a way so that it doesn't have to really sense whether the, whether the thickness is this much or this much. The structure allows it to keep a balance with an appropriate amount of fluid. And as a plural physiologist, I think that is just absolutely gorgeous. You know, <laughs> justice. Mother Nature is a wonderful, uh, wo wonderful whatever. <laughs> Inventor. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> there's your washing machine. I forgot to turn the washing machine on. <laughs> and as you breathe, and this is going round and round, it's squishing all the mucus and the stuff and keeping everything nicely coated and protecting you from all sorts of careless breathing. And every breath you take has garbage in it. So read your pollution report. And you can, you can have, I think you can get in bad pollution. But anyway, it doesn't take long to breathe a, meter, a, a cubic meter of air. And uh, successively in a day or so, you can you build up a significant load if you don't get rid of it. This just probably has something to do with cancer, too, because we get carcinogens located in there. You can't, don't get them out in time, so they, uh, they cause uh, cancer genesis in the airway, airway cells. Okay, I think I've taken you on a long enough ride. You've been really a kind audience. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and, and this is, I, I, I don't ever give these lectures without my girlfriend. <laughs> and I tell you, I, I'm so fond of her that my wife is really worried. <laughs> but she has a stepsister that you should be very much aware of. Okay? So we get that pH too low, we don't have the bicarbonate. Bicarbonate goes away, the pH goes down, you got bad mucus and bad lots of other things. We didn't go to any of those things. But anyway, so thank you very much. Oh, sure. sure.